April 2012, the 10th slideshow. This is a interesting month because as you'll see, there's so much growth, there's so much going on. You want to get out there and you want to start chopping things down. You want to start putting in some vegetables and maybe some perennials, everything else. And you just can't. At least I couldn't bring myself to do too much of it because May 1st is that last frost date. And how silly would I feel if I'm taking advantage of 70 degree, 80 degree weather and then the last week of April comes around and we have a hard frost. It could happen. Just because the last few months have been abnormally warm doesn't mean Mother Nature couldn't throw uh, you know, the most nasty weather you could imagine your way. That's, it's happened before uh, you know, throughout history and I'm not one to make mistakes after such a wonderful few months of growth. I, I just didn't want to jeopardize any of that. So this is April 1st and we're looking inside the temporary fence at uh, some little patchwork of mulch that's going on here. These are actually little mounds. They're probably about six inches across, not very big. All it is is soil from the old raised bed that we've been cannibalizing over the last few months and the last year. Uh, for projects and we mix that with some potting soil, some good organic potting soil to have like almost a little bit of a comp, sort of a compost humus layer then on top of that we put some mulch and we alternated sunflowers and peas and the peas would be growing up this sort of ugly temporary fence and hopefully we get a crop you know actually put this uh, form and structure to use instead of just having it sit there being kind of nasty looking uh, we decided to put in some peas and then the sunflowers would slowly grow up and then eventually we could put beans running up the sunflowers as well if we really wanted to and that way uh, we would be improving the soil a little bit but this is all unamended it hasn't been dug I didn't even put any kind of newspaper down or anything so we were going to have problems with grass and stuff but I wanted to take a, a less uh, destructive role in implementing beds this year, uh, less work, and just see how it goes instead of being so uptight about making sure everything was just the way I wanted it. Here's some crimson clover that's doing what it does best. It's starting to flower and put out nectar, and it's just expanding in size. There really aren't that many plants here. Uh, there are some more that are beginning to pop up, but there really aren't too many plants here. They're just putting out more branches and spreading around. That's underneath the ornamental plum. Here's some kale that's going to go to flower. I don't really like kale too much. It doesn't taste all that great. I'm sure there's some all right recipes for it, but if you've got to use butter and salt and all that other stuff to really uh, make something pop, then I would just rather have it grow as a plant in the garden as an ornamental than an edible at this point. Yeah. Maybe somebody could send me a recipe that would change my mind, but uh, it looks good. It's serving functions in the garden, so just let it be. Here's another photo of the horsetails. That's the upper pond in the top left corner of the screen. You can see down there isn't too much water in there. That's usually the water level that it likes to stay at um, because it does drain into this bog area that's fueling the growth of our dynamic accumulating uh, wetland area. I call it a wetland area. That's what it's intended to be. That's what it's going to be in the future. So that's what I call it, even though it doesn't look too much like a wetland. Uh, you can see that the first year was spent on root growth, not necessarily on shoots, because the old shoots are the dark green, and they were uh, just trying to get, you know, their foundation in, so that this year, as soon as the temperatures were right, look at the growth of these horsetails. Uh, this is exhibiting its classic behavior of rampant wildfire growth throughout your garden and people would probably start freaking out. But I'm not going to freak out because we know that it's not going to grow too well outside of this niche, first of all. And secondly, we understand that it's a dynamic accumulator, so we want it to grow rampantly so that we can cut it back often and continue to use it as mulch. Just chop it and chop it and chop it and chop it. Uh, you know, at least probably once a month throughout the summer, I would imagine that horsetails in this environment can be cut just as often as the comfrey that is sprouting behind it. And it's all being fueled by these nitrogen-fixing white clover there. Uh, we're looking south into the garden. 
again, look how thick everything is. Uh, and the cabbages, there's a whole bunch of cabbages here dead center of the photograph. Look how they're sprawled out over the bed that they were growing in. Their seed pods grew really huge and really heavy and uh, they just sort of started to fall over. Uh, and they were still growing, they were still growing, but they, they fell over uh, and just kept on pumping out flowers and seeds and you know to their heart's content, which is really cool to watch. Um, again, we, we did actually use quite a bit of cabbage, uh, not as much as some people would, but we did eat a lot of the cabbage. This was really tasty cabbage. Um, I think it was like Mizuyagi Chairman or something like that. It's a oriental cabbage from Japan. And I like this more than the traditional cabbage, at least for like a salads and everything. Although uh, sauerkraut is growing on me and that doesn't make the best sauerkraut. This is a patch within the same area that I just showed a picture of, of all these seedlings coming up. We've got some onions that I planted that are beginning to sprout, but mostly what's sprouting here are Terahumara chia. That's what looks like the little basil plants that are coming up. That's all Terahumara chia, and then these dark, uh, kind of a burgundy, almost pink colored stems. These are those relatives of the Vietnamese mint, which is a very... Uh, prolific species, as I talked about in the last slideshow. I mean, it's setting seed all over the place. Uh, so we had to thin this out. I let it grow to let them self-thin. You know, there's competition, so some of these guys are going to die. They just, you know, they're not strong plants. And then I cut back as many of them as I could once they got to a large enough stage where I wasn't, you know, plucking out a thousand plants. And I was, you know, more like a couple hundred, uh, much more... Uh, interesting to do than trying to just mow down thousands of plants at once. Comfrey, full size, full flower, full bloom, one month before last frost date. The willow oak, I'm guessing, is about 10 years old now because it's beginning to put out acorns for the very first time, at least that we've noticed, that I've noticed. Um, they, my parents can't remember it putting out acorns either, so it not only did we catch it on this period where it wants fungal soils and now we're giving it the fungal soils but it, it we definitely are giving it the nutrients it needs so it's, it's just really neat to see um, it, it gives you a good sense of satisfaction here's the second of April uh, not too much to say about this picture just like how thick everything is really nice healthy growth bright sun then the front yard, we have plans to change the front yard, but we need to brush up on our techniques, our skills. We need to observe and figure out which plants are really going to do well here over the, a number of years so that when we actually implement a new plan for the front yard, it, it'll be spectacular from the get-go and not uh, haphazard like the backyard was. So uh, the front yard is so much more public, obviously. And... Um, you can see where we've got these ornamental pears that are lining the street. And we don't have one anymore. It blew down. There used to be one between our neighbor on the right. That blew down a long time ago. And then our neighbor over there, you can see, he's, uh, had a service come out and pollard his trees. I'm sure they didn't call it that. But they're trying to strengthen the trees so they won't <laughs> break in, in high winds, which is sort of a fool's errand. I kind of feel bad for them. I think they're getting had because those trees are going to be weak no matter what they do, and that's just sad to see. Although, that's where all our branches and leaves came from last year, so I guess I shouldn't complain too much. Uh, peppers on the south-facing front porch that are uh, hopefully going to sprout soon, a few different varieties. They didn't. The seeds weren't kept appropriately, I guess, and a lot of them were given to me from a friend, and uh, they just didn't sprout, unfortunately. Another view of the garden, you've seen this. The white clover makes a very thick carpet. It's a really good plant to uh, chop and drop. Picture of the sky. The sun is almost to the point where it's going to be beating down directly on the garden, which is great. Uh, so we're not going to have to deal with that heavy shade that I've been talking about. And here's some garlic that's going to be going into decline now that the sun angle isn't appropriate for it anymore. So this fall, it'll reemerge. I would imagine all of these are going to reemerge and they're going to grow really well throughout the winter since they'll actually have the entire cool season, low angle sun period to grow instead of just a couple of months, which is what you're seeing here. So that was the second. Let's go on and third. 
seen this angle a few times already. Uh, it's just the morning. I like it. I like. I I'm really happy with what we've managed to do here. Underneath the ornamental plum, those are those crimson clover plants I showed you earlier. Fungi that are beginning to reproduce. So, you know, this this is what a healthy ecosystem looks like in its first year. Well, beginning to be a healthy ecosystem. It's it's uh, resilient science. There's a great talk from the. International Permaculture Convergence from last year, and uh, we're moving the ball to a new cup. You know, it's not really there yet, I wouldn't say, but it's on the way, and I don't see, unless, the only way that we're going to go back to an unstable system is through our actions, uh, so it, it's pretty much on a self-maintaining uh, course at this point towards accumulation with the per permanent cover crops. Aru this is an arugula, sorry, this is a dacon radish that's got really nice purple flowers, you can tell it's a brassica. Here's some chamomile that's beginning to flower underneath the willow oak. And chamomile needs a lot more sun than we've been giving it, but it grew throughout the winter here. And so it's kind of a good nursery place. Um, it may end up getting too hot in our climate to grow chamomile very well, but this is a good place to, you know, divide these plants throughout fall. So until maybe mid-September, I wouldn't want to plant anything after mid-September from a transplant. Uh, but then again in the spring, just keep just expanding from this site, moving chamomile around because it is an excellent plant. Dynamic accumulator, medicinal, uh, ground cover, foot tolerant, just you know, every, everything you can think of. Uh, crimson clover with a nice portrait picture of one of the flowers. This is with a new telephoto lens that I have. Um, well, I don't have it right now, it's being repaired, but this is going to give me a new way to photograph the garden. Uh, it's going to have less depth of the field than the wide angle lens and uh, I really like the results from this lens. It's, it's quite quite nice even in the hands of an amateur like myself. Here's crimson clover on the second swale. Brassicas flowering and you can see behind all the brassicas, this is way back, this is actually quite a ways away from here, is that telephoto effect. That's uh, sheep mulch going on and some comfrey that I should should have caught back earlier uh, but remember they're only a year old so I'm not going to be too aggressive with chop and dropping the comfrey at this point but we will get to the point where we really are uh, hacking away at these guys for biomass birches seeding bumblebees make uh, they make a bee line. You know, wow, they make a bee line. They go straight to the crimson clover. You'll see them on other plants, of course, but uh, as soon as the crimson clover comes out, it's it's something about the the nectar from these guys that they they really enjoy. And you can see there's more ladybugs out. So we are really happy with the expression of the character of all these plants. Bright, sunny day. Uh, this is a healthy spring garden, in my opinion. I, I like this. I think this is what more places should look. Something's like this. You know, it doesn't look exactly like this. I wouldn't want it to look exactly like this. You're going to choose different plants than we are. But this is healthy, whereas a grass lawn just isn't. You know, a grass lawn is sad. If you if you use your grass lawn, I've said this before, you know, I've got nothing against it, but if you just if the only time you're out there is when you mow it, uh, you know, what the hell are you up to? Here's the maple that's coming late to the party, beginning to leaf out. Some more ladybugs, some pink, uh not pink, that's not pink. That's orange. Um cilantro that's going to go to flower soon. We have lots of cilantro. The cilantro is a good cool season crop uh, and we had so much of it that we really could make coriander. I know British English people call this coriander the whole plant. We just we call the plant cilantro and then the seed is coriander. This, this, this taste is completely different in my opinion. Um, here's cucumbers. We did put some cucumbers in quite early, just a few seeds to see what would happen without watering them. The only thing we did was chop back a lot of the uh, growth around here to allow them to have some sun. They ended up dying. They didn't do too well because I didn't water them. 
Uh, here's some parsley that's going to be flowering. And everybody's favorite, this is uh, poison ivy. I could go on about poison ivy, but it's just a pain in the ass trying to uh, cut it back and uh, sheet mulch over. The birds are going to keep bringing it in and pooping along the fence line, and we're going to have to keep dealing with this plant until we fill this niche. I'm thinking a very long line of comfrey and maybe lemon balm or something that's a clumping plant that grows throughout the winter that really shades out its competitors and then maybe putting some kind of vine up along the fence as well. That's going to be an issue with the neighbor, of course, so we might have to build a trellis uh, and, and figure all this out, do a trellis and maybe have honeysuckle, maybe uh, kiwi, something else, but we'll have to figure something that was going to fill this niche so this poisonous plant is no longer bothering us. It's not like stinging nettle. This gives you rashes. You know, you can even go to the hospital uh, from the oils. So uh, it's, it's nothing to really mess around with. Onions that are on the southern facing berm, they are going to be flowering soon. Really cool. Love the onions. I just like how these arms just wave around the garden with these flowers and uh, really just neat to see the full life cycle of your plants instead of constantly keeping them in like this stage. You know, this is a romaine lettuce that you know, most people would probably chop it off at the base at this point and just go ahead and eat it. It's neat. I really like seeing the full expression of the plants so like you really know what you're dealing with in case you don't get around to harvesting them. We've seen this picture a lot before. This clover and alfalfa, red clover and alfalfa is going to be flowering soon. And I kept expecting that it would be right around the corner, maybe the next week, maybe the next week. Uh, because of how large and healthy they were, I thought they would flower. But they took a long time, but eventually they did. And when they did, it was quite spectacular. Here is the southern facing slope that we have uh, sheet mulched. And you can see the keyholes. There are a lot larger beds uh, and spaces between the keyholes this time around. There's actually kind of a little footpath along the edge of the pond there uh, that will help you reach in. But we wanted it to be a little bit bigger because we we're going to plant some of our perennial native cover crops that can get five feet wide. You know, it's almost two meter, almost two meters across, a couple meters high, and so we wanted to have some plants in here that were going to be needing a lot of space. Uh, and of course, the soil hasn't been loosened very much. I took a garden fork and loosened it a little bit just by rocking it back and forth, threw a little bit of lime down, and threw a little bit of organic uh, fertilizer because we had had soil samples from here and everything was really low, so just pretty much continuing my practice of a light application of uh, soil amendments and then organic matter to do the rest. Uh, we need cover crops in here for a few years before we try to grow anything else. And there's a green patch there that's you can see bottom left of the wheelbarrow, that is a native vetch that some birds had dropped in. So we let that grow and go to seed so we would have another, yet another kind of crop growing. And I, I think this is going to be a quite productive location. Trying to do no, little to no work, not as much digging, not as much worrying. So I'm taking a lot of pictures. Uh, I like this one. I just do. There, you can't really see too much going on, but there's comfrey growing in here. There's spinach and kale and lettuce, uh, onions, garlic, vetch, all sorts of things. Crimson clover, of course. Much more growth from the water hyacinth. The uh, the male goldfish are kind of wondering where the females went. <laughs> um, so the, now I guess they're just focusing on eating and doing their own thing. Here's the old four sisters, very, very thick cover crop of uh, red clover. And the trees are responding. You can really tell how the trees are responding to everything that we're doing. Here's the 9th of April, and you can see how large this sheet mulched area is. There's a lot going on here. And you can see how much mulch that we're using. We're patching up places in the double dug areas, so the old guilds where nothing is growing, we are putting in a little bit of mulch if there's some area that's sort of exposed. But for the most part, this mulch is going to covering the mounds. It's going towards patching areas outside the fence, uh, towards this whole endeavor here, uh, remulching the blueberry mounds. So really, 
mulching areas that we're trying to expand the garden into, using mulch as a tool to expand rather than a maintenance tool. Cover cropping is our maintenance. Mulch, you know, is a backup, but it's really for advancing the garden uh, in, in our terms because it, co it doesn't cost too much from the city, but there's a lot of time and effort that's put into spreading it, and I'd rather grow our own rather than uh, continue to rely on imports. Here's some kale, or it may even be broccoli that's going to flower here. Our broccoli didn't do too well, but again, we didn't plant any of this stuff really on time. Uh, so what we got, I was really happy with what we what we managed to get. You've seen this angle before again, but now we've got even more flowers that are coming out. Uh, good growth, very good growth. Let's go to the next set of pictures from the 12th. There's only a couple here. These are from the upstairs windows. And this is giving you a good idea of how thickly everything's planted. Ideally, our pathways would have been a lot wider because our beds are kind of small and the plants lean into the pathways and you can spread pathogens this way. Uh, so we're going to have to work on you know, maybe retooling the pathways or uh, once we have some better tools and just a machete to chop. A lot of these things are clover and stuff. You can chop with a machete pretty well. Uh, but a lot of the grasses and everything you can't. So we're going to have to get a sickle. Um, a good kind of sickle for that. So that's our major mistake. You know, we made a lot of mistakes, but they were they were more geared towards our end of ease of use. The pathways, you know, that's an ease of use thing. The plants care a little bit how the pathways are laid out because that way you can get to them, access, and give them care. You know, it's just another angle here. But at the same time, uh, they're going to grow in the beds that we gave them, and you can tell we've we've got quite a bit of biomass accumulating here uh, irregardless of how wide our pathways are and whether or not the pathways are mulched and look nice and whatever. Uh, looking from another angle, uh, this fore foreground area is really patchy and yellow because remember we do have dogs. That's why there's a temporary fence in the first place so they don't get into the garden and compact everything and go swimming in the ponds. That's not good. You can't have them swimming in the ponds. So we need to come up with some kind of plant that's going to withstand this influx of nitrogen from the urine. Um, I'm sure there's something, uh, some mix of plants we can do. We may even have to put down so, a little bit of mulch, uh, some wood mulch to absorb this nitrogen. Uh, we'll have to see what we can do. Probably some chamomile and white clover and that kind of thing. Uh, and we're, we start, we've started letting, the dogs are getting old, so we're letting the dogs out the front onto the front part, uh, front lawn a little bit more now, so they're not concentrating everything in the back. This is from the same deck. The only thing really new in this picture is this wide angle of, uh, sorry, not wide angle, but this nice spread of mulch on the left running along the brick retaining wall. That's a mirror image of the other retaining wall where there's another long strip of thick mulch that also has a sheet mulch down below it that we planted Maximilian sunflowers, which are a native perennial sunflower that will grow really thick, six, seven feet tall. So they're going to act as a windbreak because, remember, we get a lot of wind from the west, um, which is to the left of this picture. And if we can slow it down with some thick vegetation, that would be a good idea. This was shot from the other deck, and that's a really big clump of crimson clover. If you remember the pictures from last year of the garden around this time, the crimson clover was pitiful. Uh, and this is one year from a pitiful crop, letting itself sow. Uh, all, we did spread some seeds around that were grown here, but at the same time, we didn't do it. They just came up on their own. And the red clover on the right is beginning to flower. If you've got a Again, a really keen eye because I'm not. I can't zoom in and show you any of this. Uh, we have a lot, a lot of blooms now from the red clover, and the white clover is joining in on the game as well. Let's go to this next picture. These are those little mounds with some peas and sunflowers that are starting to emerge, and that's that same area that I just showed you a picture of. Dead center, you can see some of the cilantro. That is going to be, flower. actually it is flowering, you can see the flowers. So we have cilantro everywhere, so good specialist nectary all over. Here's that willow that has responded so well to everything that we've done for it. 
Um, there's some pruning that needs to be done this fall. We've talked about that a little bit already uh, with my family, and we're going to try to thin it out a little bit just because there are a lot of water shoots um, and there's some crossing branches. And we also want to make it so it's not – it leans over into some of the beds right now. The, it weeps over and it makes it a pain uh, to walk – not really a pain, but it's annoying to walk through it all the time when it's covering up your uh, pathways. We want it to grow up, not over. Here's the maple. It's not as thick as the other trees, but I, I imagine that it will be in the coming years. It's going to continue to thicken up. And one of the birch trees, looking really good. Looking really good. Uh, other section outside the fence... And more and more spider species arrive, you know, by the week, it seems. So we are, in, we have a healthy insect population to support all these different niches from web builders to uh, ambush predators, everything in between. And some of the other frogs have moved on, but this one sticks around and I, I guess continues to fight for its right for this territory. But every time it rains, and every once in a while you will see a few more frogs out here and they, they're beginning to share this territory as it uh, ri enriches. Now that it's, there's a whole lot more prey for it, this pond can sustain more than just one or two frogs. And for comparison's sake, our neighbor's backyard, which is a south-facing slope, and it's really big too, there's a, you know, we, we have a north-facing slope. She does have to deal with uh, the house casting a lot of shade in the winter, but it's also ideal. It would be ideal for a food forest there as well. And of course, there's no canopy, so that one could actually have uh, a really nice, productive upper layer. It really could, uh, but instead, it's being maintained as a grass lawn. Maybe one day that'll change. Maybe it won't. But you know, that's the difference. Uh, you're seeing these pictures. It's a huge difference. Uh, in the health. Let me see what time we're at. So we're on the last set of pictures. We've got two and a half minutes to go through about 20 some pictures. Let's see if we can do it. This is the last week of April and I've put down more mulch. I want to plant some more of those native nitrogen fixers and pioneer plants in here. Um, smothered a lot of the grass underneath the ornamental plum. I've really laid this out and said, look, you know, if you're going to mow, mow this pathway, keep just this pathway. But you know, allow these plants to grow underneath and just outside of the crowns of these trees so we can have healthier uh, trees. This is one of the blueberry mounds, really good looking garlic growing in here. The lemon balm is looking nice. There is a tree of paradise, which is an invasive from China, and we have to chop that back constantly um, if it's still growing. I mean, it just needs to be cut back every time it puts out shoots. Uh, otherwise, it's going to get big and spread seed all over the garden and cause a lot of problems. Um, the horsetails even thicker than they were before, of course. So just in a few weeks' time, how much growth they do. Like I said, they're wi they're almost wildfire. Um, look in the dead center. Look how big that comfrey plant is. It's got to be almost four feet tall. It's huge, absolutely huge. Loves being on a swale. Um, Good growth. We're allowing everything that we haven't planted. As you can see, the grass and everything is real thick. But if it starts to look to go to seed, we'll go and we'll kind of chop it back really high and make sure that it doesn't seed because we don't want it seeding. We want to be able to put our own plants into here. Here are those mounds that I had built and mulched. Uh, the transplanted white clover between the mounds there on the left is doing very well. It's flowering and it's expanding its range. So... You know, even though they have a lot of shade, there's still a little bit of growth going on there. And it's just another angle of the garden. A lot of these wide angle shots here at the end of April. Because I hadn't taken, I, I noticed that I hadn't been taking too many of these. So I wanted to include these. Um, just the dividing line. Lots of shade in this area. Lots of shade, but... 
you know, you need shady areas and you need sunny areas. This is nice. You can see how much mulch that we've already moved in just a couple weeks. I move a lot of mulch because we need to keep bringing mulch in. So you have to clear space. Uh, green guild, massive white flowers, sea of flowers. Uh, we didn't do too much with this one. This guild is is mostly we actually I, I can't say that in, in May we ended up uh, chopping and dropping this and taking some of this biomass and moving it elsewhere in the garden. Looking north, spring and a victory garden. The first spring where I can really say that we're truly following some of these. But we had to. I mean, none of this was even prepared at this point. Remember, we were still double digging at this point last year. Uh, so this is really less than a year old. And just another angle. The parsley, waiting on the parsley. Can't wait for that to bloom. Um, comfrey, I love the comfrey. It reminds me of bells. I just think it's one of the most photogenic plants in the garden. This is the dividing line. This is the You can see the swale, the first swale there. Uh, bottom left, it's running diagonally. And then you can tell that where is the transition zone, the crimson clover making a show, putting on a show for us. We've got onions in here. Um, a really dynamic place of the garden, this is. And you can look through the foreground and into the background that is thick vegetation everywhere. Remember I had chopped down some of this white clover to make room for the perennials as well as all the lettuce that's growing in here. I need to do it again. It's beginning to smother everything once once more. But you can see our echinacea. It's on the left. There's three of them. They've got uh, triangular serrated leaves. And they're, those, they're in their second year now. Uh, so they're still really young, not very healthy and strong. But they ended up flowering uh, for us in May. And... Uh, yeah, that's mostly the shady area there. That's the most shady area of the uh, green guild. So we can still, we, we have enough solar energy coming in those few short hours that we can grow things, but we still have yet to really um, pinpoint what thrives here. Uh, probably going to end up turning it, I may end up turning it into a pond. We may actually put a pond in here and just put a lot of clo uh, clo uh there's already a lot of clover, comfrey rather, because the comfrey does well with the partial shade. So uh, put it, turning it into a habitat and dynamic accumulation patch. Anyway, that's it. Uh, hopefully I didn't go too long. 32 minutes, 33 minutes, not bad. So look forward to doing May.